different ways of seeing. And this is going to be, um, I think, I hope it's inspirational um, and interesting to everybody. If it's not interesting, just don't comment. But if it is interesting, you can say anything you want, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. I want to go over a lot of photographs tonight and um, for a bunch of different types of points of view. And what I want to go, what I want to do is with, with, with that, that being said, um, I'm not going to concentrate on all the photographs. There's a lot, but I do want to comment on a few of them. I'll stop and I'll, um, you know, go through some of the quick, some of the, uh, the top photographs, explain a little bit about them, why they, I, why I've done what I've done. And then um, I even want to recommend a book at the end that you might find interesting. But the whole idea of being a point of view is to just really to be different. Um, everybody, you know, so many photographers will just stand there at their eye level, take a photograph or they'll look, look something and look at a flower and just take a picture and, and, and from where they're standing, you know, and my, my point is don't shoot from that Kodak spot. You've all been to maybe Disney World or something like that. And they have this sign up there, take the picture from here and, and whatever. And um, I, I'm, I'm going to suggest not taking the picture from there, even if it's in a perfect position, perfect place and the vi visual is great. Um, I would say lay down on the ground and take the picture looking up or something. So we'll, we'll go over that. Uh, the other thing I think that's important about point of view is um, to highlight your subject. Um, we have some idea in our mind of what we want to show the viewer. And you know, how do we do that? So the tool that we have is the camera. How do we use the camera to highlight our subject? So I want to talk about the different points of view. And the points of view that I'm going to talk about, um, some at, you know, ad nauseum and some a little bit less are uh, bird's eye view. And I'm going to kind of start with simpler ones and go to ones that are a little bit more difficult. None of them are really hard, but just a little bit more, you know, uh, thought process behind them. So really easy ones, bird's eye view, worm's eye view, close up detail, uh, frame within a frame, guideline of thirds. I don't call it a rule of thirds. I don't like rules. Um, Sandy was right about my um, rambunctiousness early in my days. I didn't like rules, but I like guidelines and uh, um, leading lines, recurring patterns, uh, near far relationship reflections, shadows as subject, truncation, juxtaposition, juxtaposition and, tilt, and tilt frame. So I wanna go over all of these and we'll talk about them. And if you have questions, please, please feel free to um, put them in the chat. And at the end, I'll um, answer uh, questions if we have time. So bird's eye view, really simple. Bird's eye view is you're a bird, you're pointing down. So a lot of these photographs are just looking down. This was a series actually of about 40 or 50 photographs. When I went to Mike, I would cross the street, the Howard Street Bridge, and there was all kinds of trash all over the place. And you know, I took all these photographs and it was basically street photizing. But, it's, but the idea is just looking down. What do you see? What, what's going on down underneath and, and below you? And people don't do that. They would stand on the street and just take pictures of people walking by if it's a street photograph. So these are easy kind of things to do. You can sit there and you know, go, up, go up to a, a parking garage and just you know, point your camera down at people if you want to and see what's going on. And you get some really interesting things, I think. Um, this is another one, just something just fun to do. I'm up on a Ferris wheel with my son and taking pictures down into the, you know, this is the uh, Howard, this is a Howard County Fair or the Talbot County Fair, I forgot which one. But again, we're looking down, it's a bird's eye view. We're a bird, you're looking down at, at something. And then take advantage of, 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 of opportunities. For instance, this is a wet market in Singapore and so many of my friends and family who were there were taking photographs standing in front of this you know, uh, these people and taking pictures of the people behind this, the, uh, their, their counters. And I noticed that there was a balcony. And so I went up to the balcony to get something different, to do a different point of view and just took the photographs looking down at these people cooking and doing their things um, at, this, at this market. So the idea is look around and see if there's opportunities for you to get a different point of view, all right? Um, this is just easy, easy things. I mean, you've all seen pictures from cruises, pictures of the ocean, pictures of the cruise ship itself. But so you do something different. I mean, I thought these, these lines uh, that they used were just huge to tie up the, the, the ship. Same thing here. The other kind of point of view, and you'll see a couple of these is horizontal or vertical. And I think that's kind of up to you, how you wanna do, how you wanna show something, whether it's vertical or horizontal. Of course, if you're doing something for a magazine or a book or something, you might have to do what you're, you know, you have to do as far as um, fitting it in the magazine, but you can do some really fun stuff. I mean, you know, looking over the balcony and uh, from the cruise ship and doing this, 
And one of the things I like also about this one is just looking at little things like the, this um, little cone sitting there that kind of offsets all these other things. It's just interesting. So um, again, just interesting things that are different. This was at the, at the harbor, at the port, loading things, and it's just something different. Um, really simple images of looking down at the escalators of, a, of, the, of the metro or subway in New York kind of things. And then we look at something like this. You'll see some of these pictures again because they are also different types and different points of view. But here's another one just looking down at, um, at, at and I'm not going to talk about what the other um, point of view is yet because we'll get to that. Again, just, you know, this is from, um, unfortunately, the museum's no longer there, but this is down from the, muse the museum. Uh, again, really interesting use of shadows. Um, 103 floors up on the um, Willis Tower, which was uh, um, the, the, the Sears Tower originally. But this was a, a, a fun thing you can do. I made this full size actually and put it on the ground, uh, covered it with um, um, acrylic and had people stand on it. And it was very strange to watch people sitting on a concrete floor and there were people who refused to stand on it. Um, even though it's just a photograph on a floor, but if you do it well and you make it the right size and stuff, it looks pretty interesting. People actually stand on this and take photographs of themselves standing on it. And this is the photograph from that um, picture. And then just really beautiful stuff. I never knew that ferns would grow like this. And the only way to find out is to shoot down on it. And speaking of ice and taking pictures through ice, this was a frozen, um, a picture of a, a, a frozen uh, creek. Um, let's go to worm's eye view. Really different, obviously. Um, this is, we're looking up. And here's easy shots. This is the cathedral down in Baltimore, um, the, the rooftop, um, the dome. Very simple things, looking up, looking up, all right? You're a worm. And um, here's a picture of the Empire State Building, um, looking up. And this is how you get those pictures of the worm. I wanted to put these two pictures in, this one and the next one. This is Irv, we all know Irv. So this is Irv taking the photograph of a, of a pug. It was the ugliest dog in the world. It had a really bad sty, so it was pretty ugly, but here he is. And, and the reason I'm showing this one and this one, this is another friend of mine. And just to let you know, these individuals are in their, over their 70s and they have no problem getting down on the ground and doing this and you have to do that. And here's some photographs that I took getting down on the ground, doing this worm's eye view to get underneath things and see in a different perspective. This is not just taking a photograph, looking down on a mushroom, it's actually showing the mushroom. And if you really are interested in this kind of mushroom thing, it shows the gills or whatever else in the bowling, it shows the different things. You can actually identify the mushroom a little bit better by taking a picture from the underneath because the gills, and, for instance, are important. Laying down in the mud. I mean, you've seen all these photos, you've all seen photographs of people taking straight on to these um, large, beautiful sunflowers. Um, this one is literally laying on the ground and pointing up. The center is um, blank because there was a wording that was put in there. But again, this is looking up at the, uh, in completely different than something that you might normally see. This is just light fixtures in a hotel looking up, turning it black and white. Black and white can be considered a point of view as well. A sculpture outside a building in Chicago, looking up. And then I did a lot of photographs of buildings, which are kind of really interesting. Um, you know, the idea of walking around in New York, for instance, or walking around in Baltimore or, or, or somewhere else and, and not looking up. And you have these really, really fascinating and interesting looking things as you're, you know, walking around. So look up, look down, look around. I think that was a TV show, anyway. Um, then the difference here is this one's the color version and the black and white version. They're different. They are different points of view. I consider black and white and color different points of view. They speak differently to us. They, um, the black and white, I think, is more form and mood, and the color is obviously more color, this one being a little bit less colorful than others. And then the idea of putting things in front or below, we're going to talk about um, near far uh, as one of the other points of view. Um, again, just looking up using the black and white uh, uh, conversions so that you can see these really interesting lines, interesting circles, 
but it's also the idea of looking up instead of right at it. Of course, some of these things you can't help but look up because they're either you know too, too, too close for you, you can't get up to another level, but you need to look up and see what's going on. Same here, here's just another one. And then there's something like this, we're, we're looking up, but then there's something in the foreground, these little lights here, and originally I would think of taking them out, but we'll see later that the idea of foreground and background and near and far can really help to see what something looks like. And the same thing here, this is just the, this is the Batman, they call it the Batman, Batman building in, in, in Nashville. Um, again, just looking up, just being something different, Fells Point, uh, uh, flea market at Fells Point. And I just really enjoy, you know, looking differently. And if you really want to see some really weird, very strange points of view, look up um, Alexander Rodchenko, a uh, photographer back in the 20s and 30s, and just fascinating stuff. Um, the other thing about using, um, looking up and worm's eye view is you get some really interesting ideas and perspective and you can do things like taking uh, if you want to do photographs like street photography using a wide angle lens and pointing up um, people think you're um, actually not pointing at them that you're pointing up but using the wide angle lens you get to add some things that you wouldn't normally want to uh, wouldn't use if you're if you're shooting straight ahead let's go quickly to a close-up so in close-up um, this is with, or you can use with, you can use a, a macro or without a macro. These are done with telephoto lenses, but just stepping back and zooming in. So um, these are, you know, the, co the colors and these are some, one of the gardens that we've been, uh, I've been to. Um, and again, just, you know, you don't really, a macro lens is really wonderful. I don't have one. Um, but then for the next fit for this photograph, I borrowed a, um, a, macro, a macro lens. But this is a combination, you'll see a lot of combinations. This is a combination of bird's eye view and close up. So this is actually looking down on this wet leaf on um, an asphalt street. And again, um, using close up, this is using a, a wide angle, a very wide angle lens, a fish eye close up. Um, interestingly enough, I tell my class, I don't want any pictures of leaves because everybody takes pictures of leaves unless there's something different. So here's a bunch of leaves that are um, old and dying, but they look really interesting. And then of course, close up can just be, and we'll see, we'll see something like this when we talk about truncation also. But this is again, a close up of the image. And um, we're gonna talk about uh, the, the guideline of thirds too and how this works. And the difference between the two, looking at these things, this one's an interesting photograph, it's okay. But I think the thing about this one is it makes it much more interesting with the, with the um, rescue um, decal and the numbers, there's more to it. It's more, I think it's more interesting, but it's still considered a close up of what we, what you normally see. Most people might step back and take uh, a photograph of the whole airplane or something. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting. I know that several people in our club take uh, car photographs and they get really close and they'll just take a picture of an emblem or the, or the fender or a light. And I think that's kind of important. So getting close up to something is, 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 is really helpful. And then you've got this um, using something close up. And, and one of the things I will mention even later is the idea of using different lenses for point of view. And for instance, there's no way to get close to this bird or to this sand crab um, unless you use a really long lens because as soon as they see you coming or feel you coming, they're gone. So the only way to get a really good close up is to use a really long lens. This one actually happens to be a 500 millimeter lens with a 2X converter and a, a 1.5 crop factor or a Nikon. Uh, so it's really a 1500 millimeter lens. Um, almost impossible to hand hold or, I mean, to put on a tripod. Even on a tripod, it, you, you gotta wait for it to stop bouncing around. But you can get close to things, so you can get close up. But how do you do it? With things like this, you can just walk right up to it and get close ups. But with something like this, you definitely would need a different lens, but it's a different way of seeing it. Frame in a frame. I think this one's really important when you're talking about how do you highlight your particular uh, subject? How do you make sure that people see what you're trying to show them? And what you can do is use a frame and I'll show you different types of frames. So frames can be these square doorway, uh, the doorways, the square pillars. This one has several frames in it. It's the pillars, it's the, the doorway, it's the second doorway. And the subject is the person standing behind uh, at the back and you can't help but see that person. I mean, there's no way you can actually not see that person because of the framing. And in this one, it's an interesting framing too, but the problem with this one, and I'm showing it to you because it's a, it's, it's a mistake. 
It's wrong. The little boy, the boy walking by should really be in toward, toward, a little bit towards the middle, more towards the left-hand side. So he's a little bit off the frame, out of the frame. So the timing is important too, but I would really much rather have this boy um, in the frame. Now, with new Photoshop tools, I could actually move the boy into the frame, but I don't want to worry about that. It's not fair. Framing doesn't have to be any square. It could be something, this is a sculpture across the street from the Radio City Music Hall. It's a Time Warner building. And using that sculpture just to shoot through it. So now you see the radio of the Radio City Music Hall and it's in, in that particular way. This one, as opposed to the kid works because it's, um, there's no other real place to frame it. And there's this guy, you, you kind of, because of the lines and the framing and of the girders, you see this person walking by. I think that this is also can be considered framing. It's just shooting through a fence. It's no big deal. Um, it's easy to do. Just don't focus on the front, on the fence, focus beyond the fence. And this is a, just a vacant lot, which I thought was really interesting looking through the fence and you see the flag and raising, but this is just, again, it's just looking, using something that's available as a, as a frame. And it doesn't have to be a great picture. I'm not gonna show you every picture here is not gonna be a great picture, but it's just, hopefully it's an, an example of what I'm trying to talk about. Um, this is another one that I, that I kind of like. It's, a, it's, it's really interesting framing, but it's also the idea of the light is working here. So you've got the dark frame on the right-hand side, which is the garage. And then the light brings you over to the left-hand side. And we'll see things, we're gonna talk about leading lines too, but you'll see these, this frame of the light actually, of that building of the light within that stair, stairwell. And that brings out that person. You can see the person, it takes you right over to them. But what's interesting and what I wanna go over with you a little bit is the idea that um, a frame doesn't have to be a frame. It doesn't have to be a square box or a circle or anything like that. Here, the frame is the three little devils. And this person walking by is um, framed by those devils. Now, what's interesting about this image is a lot of times when I do street, I'll find a background that I really like and wait for somebody to come, come by. And one of the things I like about this photograph, I love the picture of the dog who's uh, kind of looking at the, um, the devils and kind of moving away from it. But in this situation, the woman is definitely being framed by those little, little imps. Here's a, a similar idea. So the person in the middle is framing, and this is also a leading line, the line going up from this um, pole here, going into the, uh, all around the purses. And she's just poking out of the purses, and you can see her. And, there's no way to miss her actually. Although I can tell you that a judge did miss her um, and after a while she's, oh my God, I didn't see that. But they're not, they didn't look at it really well. Um, a story about this one really quickly and um, the person who's with, who was two people were with me. Um, every time we went to, we pointed the camera at her, she went back up into the, um, into the store. I don't think it was us. It was just like she kept going back and forth from the store. And so my friends left and he walked away. And I saw this um, woman coming towards the store. It was obviously a customer. And I figured this girl would like put her face out again. And, and she did and um, got the picture. And then you've got things like this. Here's a series of photographs and images that I want to kind of show. These were the first couple of images. I'm working on them, seeing which ones I like. And then I came out with the, the final one, which is the, this, this guy framed by the, um, the backhoe. And so I think it was, it was a lot more interesting when he was framed by the back of. So here are these other ones kind of walking around. The one down at the bottom right, he's sort of out of the frame. He's not really framed well. But then this one, he's framed pretty well. I, I kind of like that. Framing can be anything. This is uh, my son at the National Aquarium. If you remember, when you go to the National Aquarium, they have those bubble things, the big glass tubes with the bubbles. It's framing. It's looking at you know this person who's in between these frames. Um, this is um, Captain America, who's riding in the, um, the Metro in DC. And what's interesting about this, or um, um, uh, New York, I think, Never mind. But um, what's interesting about this, I think, is that, um, again, we're gonna talk about the guideline of thirds, the idea of, you could put this in right in the center. I could have centered the, the doorway, the entranceway, whatever, but doing things like putting it off to the side, adding a sign, the danger, keep off the tracks, high voltage kind of thing, I think adds a little bit to the image. And then you've got something like this, which I would consider a double 
framing. So you've got the framing of the uh, Christ on the on the cross, and then you've got the framing of the homeless guy walking, um, and he's framed by the door. This is another image where you I sat and waited until something came by, that something interesting came by. So it's like kind of a double frame um, of what's going on. Same thing here. This is underneath. Um, um, the metro station in, in the uh, subway in, in, in New York, um, waiting for a train and just looking across and using that whole framing idea of seeing the person sitting across the, uh, across the tracks. And then this one I thought was really interesting. This was in um, uh, the Bahamas. And um, I just thought that was interesting. This could also be, we'll talk about juxtaposition uh, later on, but this could also be a juxtaposition shot, but it's again, framing through this um, the stone, um, the gravestone of a uh, with the cross into the um, gravestone of, a, of of the of the Jewish star, the star of David. Again, something interesting using the framing. Here's another issue of framing. We'll talk about this one again later too. And then things like this. I mean, this is a you know a really interesting you know idea of a frame uh, framing the people that the, the elephant handlers. Um, using the elephant as the, as, the, as the frame. This is down at um, uh, Birmingham, Alabama. They have a gauntlet that you can, you can uh, walk for the civil rights um, era and just looking through these fences and looking at the kids, but moving, moving yourself so that you can try to get everything into it. So you have the two statues in the back and then you have the two kids in the front um, so that you can Again, the framing of the idea is to really see what's going on, highlighting your, your, your um, subject. Very simple. This is just um, the, the um, in DC, the, um, the, the train station in, in DC. Again, just using what you have. It's, it's, it's kind of easy, but you really should, you need to look for it and figure out what you're doing. And then here's another example. Is it, does it work with vertical or does it work with horizontal, landscape or portrait? And of course, you know, you don't have to, you, we know that the actual um, um, subject here are the people in the boat, the fishing, the people fishing in the boat. And, um, but how do you frame it? So, and move around, see how you can do it. I, I like putting it off to the side. Again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, this one is great. We know, now know where Elvis is uh, in New York, but here's a good story for this one. Um, when this one came up for, a, um, and this will give you an idea what I think of some of the judges, and I, I'm sorry I didn't mean to say that, but anyway, um, the judge who looked at this thought that it should be cropped to the window of just the window of Elvis. And um, I heard several people in the audience um, totally disagree, and I disagree too, because we've got leading lines here, we've got the world with guideline of thirds, and we've got that frame of Elvis. He's framed by everything. He's framed by the pipe, by the uh, by the downspout. He's framed by the window he's in. He's framed even by the window the window in the doorway beneath. So he's framed by that. And then here's just some more um, examples of, of of framing and putting it in. Um, these were done by uh, my smartphone. These were done on a smartphone. And you can do this. Point of view is great. When I teach point of view in my classes, um, students are allowed to use any phone. This was this is the second. Uh, assignment I give. Uh, the first assignment is texture. The second assignment is point of view. And they're allowed to use any camera because the camera doesn't matter for this at all. Um, this is all about where you are, where you're standing, how you're using framing, how you're using leading lines, et cetera. And this here's another one. This is going back down. These are cannons. This is in a, um, Key West at the fort in Key West. And it's just going way back. And, you, and, if you, and again, it's moving and lining yourself up so you see what you want to, what you want to get. Of course, there's tourists here, and you have to wait a while until they're all gone, and then shoot the shoot the film, shoot the image. So the idea is, um, be patient. Um, I think you really do have to be patient for a lot of this stuff, and um, look for a really great angle. Um, I actually went way back to see how far I could get down, and how many you know different um, levels I can get, because um, I was more in the middle. It didn't work really well. So backing up and going through and seeing what's going on. So you could get a really good shot. So that's that. This is also framing, though it may not look like framing. Uh, I think it, you see uh, the frame of the black shadows of the building um, kind of highlight that guy down at the bottom who was scalping tickets in, um, in this was in Nashville. So the, the, the actual, the Trail West American Steam, that building is kind of framing the top part, 
But the real frame is that V down at the bottom where you see that guy standing there hawking his tickets. And of course, if you've been to um, Dumbo, um, yes, I used to be called Dumbo a lot, but this is down under the Manhattan Bridge over uh, overpass. And um, turning around, just turning around and seeing the Empire State Building framed between the girders of the building, of the uh, bridge. So again, it's another way of, of, of emphasizing the subject. And then things like this, I think framing is so important because if you look closely, you have to look a little bit harder, but not that hard because of the frame to see the guy behind the lemons and under the cheese fries. And you do see him most like, mostly because of the frame. He's framed within that particular area. I think it's also looking, you know, seeing the frame of the coffee on the left-hand side is kind of interesting. It's a frame. Um, some will say you can't have two subjects, two, more than one subject in an image. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll disagree with that. But this subject obviously is the person kind of looking out. And he's also, his eye is framed by the lemon. So the, the idea, the idea of lemons lemon. kind of, you know, uh, the kind of dip in the lemons to, to, to um, highlight and frame the guy's eye. And here we've got um, what I consider, again, maybe you could call this multiple um, framing, multiple subjects. So you've got the multiple subject. You've got the first subject on the left-hand side of the guy looking out. And the frame here is that out of focus toys that are in front of him. But then if you look to the right-hand side and you kind of follow his gaze, um, you'll see another little thing framed, the little boy who's walking, you know, towards um, walking in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, carnival area. And again, framed by that blur. So when I talk about framing, it doesn't have to be something specific. It doesn't have to really be something that, oh my God, that's a frame. It's something that frames or surrounds your image or makes it so that you are looking at that image, that you see your subject because you can't really look anywhere else. Here's another one. This is a person I think who's, um, there's two reasons for this. One, she's looking straight at the, straight at me so you kind of it kind of pops out but she's also framed by those people and kind of framed by the signs but a frame doesn't have to go all the way around either a frame can be just this like u-shaped idea where this person is framed between you really see her pretty pretty clearly this one is um i think the let's fix it is the is the subject here but it's and it's framed by the the, the light light post and the and the um and the um street lamp post but it's also framed by the person on the right. So that's the part that kind of keeps you from going off to the right. But you have all these really interesting ideas of the let's fix it, the tax Wall Street, but the let's fix it pops out, I think because of, this, of the, of the um, light fixtures. And also let's talk about the leading lines for a second. I'm gonna get more of that. If you look at the light fixture, there's also that no left turn sign, which kind of points back into that um, frame area. And then of course you can look at something like this and it's all frames. And I can tell you this, if you, if you look at every one of these photographs, every one of these rooms really closely, like really blow them up and zoom in and look at them closely, you will see no people. And I got really frustrated with not seeing any people there, or any, you know, watching TV or anything like that. And then I realized it was a really slow shutter speed. So there's, it's a 27th floor in Chicago and there's, there's no way you could get somebody who's not moving. So um, yeah, this didn't work, but it's still an interesting idea that all these different multiple frames within that it's framed on the outside and then it's each individual frame. So it's just another way of seeing things. And then I wanna go, I'm kind of like uh, going to the guideline of thirds, uh, kind of splitting it up here, because I think what, you'll, what you've seen previously and what you're gonna see you know, coming up are more things about composition and how that works and how that makes your uh, point of view stand out a bit better. So of course, we've always seen this kind of thing. And as a matter of fact, you can set this in your cameras to actually show this grid. And the idea here is that these um, the large black dots are what called what we call powerpoints, um, and the powerpoints are where you would normally place your um, subject. Um, there's uh, all kinds of stu studies that have been done on why this works and why it's important, but I think it's just important because it just looks good, and I think that's people talk. Um, there's been writings on why it looks good, why it works. So this is one for a, a vertical a portrait shot. Obviously, the horse there is a PowerPoint is on the PowerPoint, and you'll see later on that it doesn't have to be directly on that PowerPoint, but it has to be in that area. We'll see that again. And then here's the landscape version of it. Um, 
just the PowerPoint is where the, those, those pretty umbrellas are, the people sleeping on the beach. And then we can talk about this. This is um, actually, this was a, a, a tank down in Baltimore, uh, a large vat. And it's, um, you can, it's, if you measure it, um, and you don't have to right now, but if you measure it, it's um, a, golden tri a golden rectangle. Um, if you want to look up golden rectangle in Fibonacci, you can do so. Um, but it's kind of like, again, it's one of those things that people look at in, in composition on, on how something works and, you know, what does it, what is, how does it, what does it do? How do, how does it make us feel? Um, we look at Nautilus shells and, and, and all kinds of things and how they, this, the uh, um, rectangle becomes the circle and becomes all kinds of interesting things. But I just thought this was interesting because it just shows what it is. Um, then this is, uh, again, we're talking about uh, uh, guy line of thirds. And the important part of this is my son, who's standing up in this window that, that pokes out from the Willis Tower, the Sears Tower. Um, and you can actually look down from it. And if you, I don't think you can see it, but behind him, there's a woman in another one who's actually trying to feel before she walks out on it, she's feeling to see if it's safe. Two things about this that are interesting. To clean them, they come in. And then somebody walks out and, you know, um, when they come into the building, they'll clean them. I always thought it'd be a really neat James Bond introduction where the bad guy starts pushing them out and, you know, James Bond falls, but he has a parachute or something like that. Um, the other thing interesting is several years later, there, you can see there's two levels. Uh, the, the first level actually shattered, which was kind of interesting. I was not there. I don't want to be there. And then again, uh, guideline of th the guideline of thirds. Um, yeah, the image is kind of halved, but the lighthouse is in that um, PowerPoint area. Same thing with portraits. Don't put somebody right in the middle, unless there's ways, ways of doing that. Obviously, guidelines can be, um, or rules can be broken. But obviously, in this situation, put, put, put somebody, you know, his face is in that PowerPoint, so you, you see him right away. Um, here's a similar image. The, the, the person on the left-hand side is the subject. And we see that person because they're all the way over on that left-hand side, all the way by themselves on that PowerPoint area or near the PowerPoint area. Same here, just using portraits to use, you know, um, to, to really visualize and show what's going on. In this situation, the same thing, finding a background and then putting something in front of it. Um, this is my son. But the thing that's other, the other interesting thing is if you look at the shadow in its face, and you'll see that the eye, the eye is actually at the at the one third area that uh, you know in the third upper upper right part of his eye. So here he is in the a PowerPoint area of the guy line of thirds. But then if you look at his face, you've got his eye, which is also in that kind of um, area that 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 third type of area, that PowerPoint area within his face. So you can combine things. Here's another really good, uh, I think, a good example of of, of using that. Um, guideline of thirds, putting them as, you know, as close to that area as you can. This one, I don't know if he's here, but this is for Lewis Katz. Um, he's, and I, I'm not a cat person, but this was a, this photograph came out, I thought really nicely. And again, we're talking here, there's a multiple things. There's framing and there's also um, the, the guideline of thirds. Again, a way to highlight your subject. We talked about, we showed this one earlier, but now I want to show it not as a framing issue, but as a, a rule of a guideline of thirds issue, putting the person way up in, in the upper left-hand corner, which I think is interesting because the ship is like this just plain white, uh, all this plain white surface. And then you've got this guy looking out the window, the, the cutting. Um, this, this was my tree. Um, many of us in, our, um, in the club have their, their, their own trees. Um, you'll, you'll see, you'll hear that man be banting about. This was my tree, it's no longer there. Um, and I don't have a problem um, taking pictures in the winter. As a matter of fact, this is one of the photographs of many that I show my students who uh, do take my classes in the winter, saying that there's no excuse for not going out and um, taking pictures in the winter. You get some great shots. This is just down in Worthington Valley area. So here, just example, the, photo, the, the, the image, the, 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 the subject is not necessarily in the, directly in a PowerPoint, but the idea is it's not centered. 
it's off to a side, it's down near the bottom. You, you, know, you, you have to look at it because everything else is kind of, there's nothing there. And you see this little stark tree just hanging out and, and sitting out there all by itself. It wouldn't work the same as it, if it was in the middle. Uh, the same, same thing here, you know, using a, that large space and the people down at the bottom, they're basically, let's say at the bottom third of this image. Same thing here, the boy is like at the bottom right third of the image. And then here's another one. This is one, um, a, a serendipitous, we, I actually went, um, this was in um, Thailand and um, we had finished riding a, a, the elephants and I turned around and everybody's looking at the elephants and watching and, and I turned around and, and saw this. And again, we're talking about the idea of using the thirds and putting a guy's foot, the mood's foot, um, on the right-hand side. And what's interesting, but I, I just want you to know, just for those of you who um, are animal lovers as I am, I, I call this um, fun ride guilt trip because it was really a fun ride, but I felt kind of guilty after I did it. But they seemed to enjoy it. The elephants seemed to be well-treated and I was okay with that. But here's the idea of the fact that the foot is on the right-hand side. So you see the foot, but you also see the elephant's eye and you, we certainly know it's an elephant. This one is really interesting. This one. Um, did really well in competition BCC, one of the first photographs I entered, it breaks the rule. It, it, it breaks one of the rules and one of the rules being, you know, the boat should be coming into the image, not going out of the image. But I think what makes this image is the wake of the boat. So what you do is you see that wake, which kind of balances out the boat moving off to the left-hand side. Also, because of the amount of space here and putting that boat, the crabber, very close to that PowerPoint, it really emphasizes that, that, that um, image, that, that subject. Same thing here. Here's, um, you know, obviously taking this idea of, of, of the, the, the guideline of thirds, which can also be considered balance. So we're balancing this big, heavy rock with all the smaller rocks on the right-hand side. Um, so it, 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 in a in way that kind of works too, it's kind of satisfying instead of that rock being, say, pay, you know, sitting right in the middle. This is the image we saw earlier with the PowerPoint, but without the, um, the grid on the top. And here's another one. We're going to see this again. We're going to see this image again also. But the idea of the, this is an image of, it can be uh, near far, it's shadows, and of course, it's the guideline of thirds. And then there's something like this one, which is also um, thirds. Again, it doesn't have to be necessarily in that PowerPoint, but what we've got here is the image is in the top third. So you got the two thirds down at the bottom, which is basically empty. The top third has this, um, this jetty with the people fishing off of it. And then the people themselves are moved off to the right-hand side in the right third of the, of, the Im of the image. So the subject is really easily seen, highlighted. So then leading lines, I think is another really crucial way of um, showing a different point of view. Really important, taking your, um, the viewer into your image and guiding them to see what you want them to see. So just the simple things, here's a simple C curve. Um, it's very easy, it's, there's nothing special about it. One of the things that's not good about it um, is that if you follow the C curve around, it actually takes you from around here takes you out of the image and you really don't wanna be taken out of the image. Even here, if you go here and you see this pole, you go up to the pole, you're still out of the image. The tree doesn't really bring you back in. So this is a really bad example if you were gonna, if you were gonna do something like a really great photograph, but it's a really good example of what a C curve looks like. And the next one, really another obvious, but very simple, um, non-spectacular image is an S curve. This is a reverse S curve. So it, 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 it brings, it goes this way. Your eye follows it up through here and goes to the back. But again, it takes you out of the image. So what you want to do is you want to do things that don't um, take you out of the image, that kind of keep you within the image, but still using those leading lines. So in this situation, here's a, basically a kind of a, an S curve. The, the S curve is here but it brings you up and then you, the bridge brings you back in and the rock brings you back down. So you're actually staying within the image. And yeah, the foot becomes a leading line also in a way it brings you up to here in, in that side there. So in, 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 in partially that works, but, it, but again, it's not just the leading line, it's that thirds idea. Everything's you know, up in that third area. It's nothing's like right in the middle. 
Here's another one. And one of the ideas also, and you see a couple more of these, is the leading lines don't necessarily have to lead you directly to a subject. The subject can be the image itself. So in this situation, it's leading you back into the image, into this thing. And as the fog grows, your eye kind of like doesn't leave the, Im the image. It kind of stays there. And maybe it even gets hooked up on this tree in the center. But the idea is you start from the left-hand side, you follow this rail down and, and you're, you're, you're there. This is the Antietam Courthouse. Um, yeah. Um, but anyway, the, um, the um, yeah, uh, uh, whatever, I'm confused myself. Um, again, same thing here, but here's the idea of using pattern necessarily as a, as a, um, a leading lines. The, the leading lines here are the trees, but also the posts and the rails. And basically it's just leading you back into the image. It doesn't leave, okay? If you notice, if you notice here, it doesn't leave. So the trees come back here, they end around here, the posts and the rails come back here. So it's, in other words, it's taking you into the image there's really, the image itself is the subject, and this is one way of showing it. And then of course, I'm looking at um, vertical or horizontal, I don't know. And then the thing about this one, you'll notice that in this left-hand one, it's kind of like the, um, the thirds, guideline of thirds, but the one on the right is a little bit more centered, a little bit more centered, because what we have here is we have the two leading lines in the triangle leading back into that, into that tree. So in this situation, you can put it a little bit um, um, centered. Um, I also want you to know for those people who are like really uh, about um, horizontal um, and, and level uh, horizons, um, look at the tree, this is level, it happens to be a hill. So um, if you look at some of the posts in the tree, it's, it is level, just wanted to make that clear. Again, something this is leading back, obviously the, the um, Lighthouse is the subject that I want to show. And so I'm using that modified zigzag S curve to um, bring you back into it. <coughs> Here's several leading lines. You've got the, um, the, the, the cliff here, you've got the logs, you've even got this um, other um, stick here bringing you into that area. Using patterns as, um, as um, leading lines, the patterns of the, 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 the portals, um, yes, the roof, but you also have the portals, top and bottom, leading back into this. This is a black, this is a color image that um, I turned into black and white. And then really simple stuff. I mean, this is really easy. This is on a cruise ship and they have everything lined up and there's a nice S curve that's just bringing you into the um, image of all this stuff that's going on, um, the, the towers and whatever of the, of the cruise ship. Just another image of um, using the, using, um, the fence fencing to go back. Again, um, this is not a line, but it's a pattern that forms a line, all right? So it's like an implied line. So implied lines are really interesting and they don't have to be going straight out. So here's a, a, here's an, here's a C curve, but it's a vertical C curve. This is the bridge at Howard Street, Howard Street Bridge. So you can do use the leading line that takes you up. It takes you up and back, back down. And the foreground here, the, the subject could be the uh, graffiti that's on the bridge. Again, leading lines don't have to be straight ahead. And then we saw this picture previously um, for a bird's eye view of the people here. But one of the things that takes you down to those people are the steps, right? The, the uh, fire escapes, they'll take you down towards these people. So the, again, guiding down through the steps, but also the windows kind of take you down to see what's going on below. This is, you know, this image is, um, it, it, it's got the leading lines and everything, but again, it's one of those things that's kind of taking you out of the picture. Um, the guy's arm is a leading line taking you out of the image. So it really doesn't work for me. Um, some of you might um, think, you know, okay, there's the, the, the fishing line and this fishing line might bring you back. But actually, I think that this takes you out of the image. You keep going and you follow it around and you're gone. Even with this guy looking out that way, you're, you're, you're kind of gone. There's nothing interesting going on in this area, which is where you would put something, some sort of subject matter to make it really interesting. Unlike this one, which you might say, well, gee, this one's not even not as good as that one at all. But this one's kind of interesting because you've got the leading lines that point out here, the railing that point out to the beach. But then what happens with these fishing rods is it also goes there and the little tips 
that bring you back down into the image. So this might work that way. And again, we're talking about thirds and how that, um, how that works. Um, straight on kind of thing, you know, taking you back way back into the um, end of that pier. Um, really easy stuff. This is just the very color. This is a Washington DC Metro. Now this one's kind of complicated, but it's still leading lines. It's a lot of leading lines. I call it complicated leading lines. And it takes the viewer, it takes you really around this whole thing. You start here maybe, and you go around, you see these people, you see this person, this person here, you see these people, you go up here, you come back down this way, you come back up here, you come around, maybe you go out that way, but probably come back down here. And you're moving around and you see the tables because you've got this framing of the tables. So again, it's something interesting that works. And this one, I think, is also this. I would call this a modified um, S curve or a Z curve of the Staten Island Ferry, where you follow the the, the, the gangplank up, and that's where all the people are. And it, you don't really leave the image. You kind of go back here, and as it fades away, you there's nothing that takes you out of the image. You stay within the image that way. And again, when I'm thinking of uh, when I think of, of 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 the subject, the subject does not have to be a particular item or anything. It can be the actual image itself. And so here's obviously using um, kind of the thirds, but also using uh, the leading lines that take you into the image. But again, the idea is it fades off over here on the left-hand side. So you don't really go out of the image. You don't really leave, you kind of stop here and then you might come back and, and look at all the craggly uh, orchard uh, apple trees. Um, and, but again, the idea is if, if I had stopped it here, it takes you out of the image, but by stopping it over here and allowing more of that white color to come in, it bl which blends into the rest of it. You kind of come up, you follow it, and then you kind of like fades off. And so you don't leave the image. This one's in a similar way. This is actually um, a picture of Sarasota. Um, so there's the, here's the gulf, but here's the, the, um, the waves and the surf, whatever. And you're coming back here and you follow it back and you stop here because there's Sarasota. Uh, that's the city of Sarasota looking that way. Um, you could also consider, and we'll see this in a minute, um, you can also consider the rays, the, the rays of the, of the, of the um, sun coming through these really dark clouds as leading lines bring you down, but that's not the leading line. The leading line is actually this surf, which, and then of course the horizon, and it all converges on Sarasota. Simple leading lines, these are easy. We're gonna see this picture again, but these are easy lead lines down the harbor, just taking the lines and it's a, this is using a, a very wide angle lens and just bringing yourself up into the ships. And again, you're kind of moving around. It doesn't really take you out of the image. And another easy one, this is with a fisheye lens and you're following, the, you know, the fisheye lenses are great because just about everything is sharp and in focus. So you're coming with the wire, you're coming around, you actually maybe you come, come around the little um, knot there, come back up and up to the TV. So again, taking you in. Um, again, I just wanna show this one because the trees again are your image and the, the fencing. Pretty obvious with the, um, you know, what's going on here with the leading line of the pattern of the um, Buddhas going into the larger one. And then you do things like, you know, you figure, okay, this is also a leading line. It's these frozen feet. Um, when you walk, when you, when people walk on this ice and snow, they compress and by being compressed, it, 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 it lasts a little longer. And of course, leading lines can actually be arrows. It doesn't have to, you know, you can, you can make it arrows. Here's um, the one, the, um, if you look at this picture closely, the, the actual subject of the image is the guy back here reading. So this is not the subject of the image, even though a judge said, um, did, you did you ask him if you could take his picture? And it was like, no, he was asleep, so I wasn't gonna bother him. But the, but the, 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 the real image is the guy back here because the chairs are, you see him first, and then the chairs, go, the chairs lead you back to the guy who's reading the book over here. So what's your subject? And then some really subtle stuff. So subtle images, this is, this is Lake Michigan, by the way, frozen in a, on a February several years ago. Um, it's fresh water, so it freezes pretty quickly. But here's the leading lines. The lines are the different folds in the, in the ice that actually take you back, especially the first ones here. They take you back into the image and take you into the ice. These are about 12 to maybe 15 feet high. 
And then if anybody can look at this one and give me an idea of what you think the, um, the uh, leading line is, um, this is an implied leading line. And you have to look for stuff like this, which makes it really interesting. So the subject matter is the guy with the, you know, the British kind of hat, the, 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 the getup that he's wearing, the costume. The line is the woman's gaze back here. So this woman who's looking at him, all right, that's the leading line. There's no line here. This is not, I wouldn't consider this tent a line. It's her eyes. Her eyes are the line. She's watching this guy, looking at this guy. Sort of emphasized by this woman's hand, but it's the eyes. So you see him, you look at her because she's all the way over to the side by herself. And there you, and there she's looking at this guy and um, that's the leading line. So the leading line can be all kinds of things that lead your viewer into the image or into and onto a subject. All right, so near far relationship, we've seen some of that. I think near far relationship is kind of like a leading line also, You're look, but it's more like something in the foreground to leading you into the background. So I wanna show you a couple of these images. So here we've got the, 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 the foreground, the, 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 the near is the um, plants and the dead hay or whatever that is leading you back into the, um, the building in the background. It's also framed by the trees and this little mountain here. Using the, um, this is, this is um, Tala, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. They have tours there. Um, I think we want to plan a, a trip out there sometime for the club. Again, the idea of near far, but it's a, I think it's the idea of something looking really near and you're looking back, it's a lead type of leading line. We could also say that the gaze is the leading line back to the woman buying something. We've seen this before. This is near far. So the big um, cleat in the beginning, in, in the front, leading you back with a line to the, to the boats. One of the things I suggest is a lot of times um, people will take this picture here, for instance, the Boston Shoe Repair Company, which is really cool. And I've seen a couple of photographs of just that and not taking a, something um, of the front here, this, this hydrant. And this is another example. Um, I did a workshop and took people down to um, the harbor and, I, and everybody took a shot of this reflection. Only one person took a shot with that, which shows scale. It gives you some idea of a, a line goes back into that. Um, so it's really an interesting way of looking at it. Same thing here, near far. So this is, um, you know, looking up, it's a worm's eye view. So again, you can combine points of view. If you've never been to the um, trolley museum down uh, on Falls Road, you're missing something, you need to go. Again, foreground and background. And I just want to comment for those of you who do enter competitions, watch what you title things. If you title this boat on the uh, um, golf, um, the judge will say, well, the boat's out of focus, so um, you can't title it that. One of the neat things I think about um, with near far is you get this really interesting scale and perspective. So um, this is not a little tiny person. This is a regular sized person, but we're so close to this monument with this person walking underneath that you see um, this really interesting perspective and scale. Again, part of near far, same thing here. And again, you can consider this leading lines back to these people meditating in the back. This no longer exists. Well, the building's still there, but the interior is not. It's St. Stanislaus Church down in Baltimore. Again, what you're doing in near far, the books, and they're actually pointing back into the area. And then you have the framing. So again, combining all these different uh, forms of points of view. Just down at the harbor, you know, really interesting points of view. <clears throat> um, obviously the foreground here is certainly part of the subject. I mean, looking at all these really great fruits and things, but then also so is the person back here buying the stuff. And then this one is again, you know, what's the subject in a for in a in a in a near far? Is it thing in the near or is it thing in the far? In this situation, it's the near part. This is a, a album cover, um, and this is the person. Um, he's a guitarist, and that's his goat and his dog and his wife and some other animals that he has on his farm. And he's certainly 
the 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 um but it also tells a story a story of him you know in his on his farm with his animals he's got his guitar great guitar player by the way and going back and here so you've got near far she's out of focus because she's not important as compared to the next shot this shot where if you look at this one the first thing you see is this blurry image of the bride but the subject is actually the mother and the son and the groom so you have the foreground, which is large, but because our brain doesn't like stuff that's out of focus, we look around and say, oh wait, this is sharp and focused. So that's the, actually the subject. I wanna quickly go through reflection. I think I have a little more time. Um, go through reflection. I think reflection is a really interesting and easy thing to do. Um, and I'm gonna kind of go through these a little, a little quicker. Um, but reflection is simply that. It's just reflection. How do you see something that's different than, other, than somebody else? This was, um, this was at the um, New Orleans Jazz Festival several years ago. And a friend of mine just, friend and I just put out these mirrors just to watch people's reactions. And it was just amazing how many people stopped and did their makeup and did all kinds of stuff and whatever. We just sat there taking pictures. Um, this is the bridge. I think it's the Brooklyn Bridge, but um, everybody takes pictures of the Brooklyn Bridge Take it as a reflection, it's really interesting. Same thing here, just using the reflection as just to make it different. It's also, look at this, it's the guideline of thirds, right? You've got the top third is where all the action's happening, really. This you can consider as framing if you want. And then there's such really neat glass buildings, but the thing about the buildings is don't just take that one window, take some other architectural ideas, the tree in the bottom left, that, that part that comes down in the middle. Um, here we see this one again, we've, we've talked about, we, we mentioned that a little earlier. This is a mica. And then this is interesting. Um, I like this image. Um, it's, this is actually a mirror on the side of MoMA, uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York. And this is a, a reflection of, of stuff across the street. And what, but, but what's interesting about this um, picture, I think, is are the, tra are the trash, the, all the trash and the people that are walking through. But this is a reflection, but it has more things in it. It's not just the reflection. If anybody ever saw the Twilight Zone episode about the um, woman who um, thinks she's a normal person but ends up being a mannequin, you'll get this one. So um, I don't have to explain it. If you understand, it. if you ever saw that episode, um, you'll know what I'm talking about. But the neat thing about reflections also you get these like weird effects if it's a double window or something. And this is not upside down reflection in the water on the, in the surf when it was just really smooth. Another reflection, this was done with a, a smartphone. This is uh, Hemingway's house in, um, in Key West. Yes, this is in the center. Somebody's gonna bring that up that it's in the center, but it's in the center for a reason. First of all, it's got the, it's on the, it's in the top third, but the, 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 the symmetry of the thing is such that you can put it in the center. It's okay to break that quote unquote thirds rule, but it's still kind of the thirds because the top part is in the third, the bottom part is at two thirds. And then what balances it out is the a reflection of the mast and it's the symmetry of it. Uh, another, just a tip for everybody, just a tip. This was my son's wedding and they were signing the ketubah, the marriage contract. And it was a small room and nobody could get into it, but there was a door that was open. And on the other side of the door was a mirror. So nobody could get in into this um, room, including the photographer they hired who made a lot of money. But um, so I took a picture in the mirror to get them um, to show up. And it was just absolutely perfect, you know, um, the lining was it, it was lined up perfectly. And then quickly, shadow is subject. Um, in this situation, what I mean the shadow is subject that looking at the shadow, the shadow is what makes the image, not just the, um, the, the subject that's not just the thing that's making the shadow, but the shadow itself is the image. And so the same thing here. This one's just a little bit um, with the shadow in its eyes. We saw this before. I think that a silhouette is a shadow. Um, some people will disagree with me and say that it's not a shadow, but if you think about it, a silhouette is actually a shadow. You're standing in the shadow, taking a picture. This is a, uh, an image with a cell phone, and this is a, a, over in, um, in um, 
a Cumberland area. So if you if anybody wants to say that it's not a shadow, um, go back and look at what silhouettes were back in the um, eight, late 1800s and things. They were all done by shadows. And then using the shadow as subject, here's the shadow as subject, two things. Here, the, it's leading lines of the shadow going into the gravestones. Um, but it's also the shadow itself is this fingers going into the gravestones. Um, this is one of those things we were walking out. We've been taking pictures all day and turned around and like, whoa, there's this like really cool image. Of, it's got a story to tell. Same thing here. This is the shadows being used as a leading line. And then here's an, here's like I did. I have a couple that are here's what it looks like. Um, if you just take a picture of it, this is what maybe other people might take. Here's the shadow as subject, just looking at the shadow. We don't know what that is. It could be a real person dancing. And then you can also do something like this, which gives you a little really good idea of what it is, but still the shadow is important. Here the shadow is important because it, um, people have described this as to me as being very melancholy and very sad. Of somebody has passed away and the chair is empty and there's that shadow of the person. So the shadow here, be again, becomes the subject. And then you can just do things that are using the using a shadow as 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 abstract stuff. So these are just abstract images. Um, this is a terrible picture, but it's just an interesting shadow. Again, just using shadows. The people here, we know there's people there because we see their shadows. Um, this was a project some of us did. We played around with it. Um, I've got probably 50 or 60 of these images of me taking pictures, and they're all kind of in the same place because they were all doing the same day, or different days, but made sure the sun was in the same area. And this is the kind of thing you have to look for. Quickly, truncation. Truncation is easy. Truncation is just we know it's a lighthouse. We know it goes higher, but we've truncated the top part. I had to put this in. The elephant's truncated, but there's an elephant's trunk. Is also tilt frame, if you will. And then we know what this image is. It's certainly truncated. It's not the entire animal, but we know it's a zebra. And then juxtaposition, we've seen that before. Again, juxtaposition is usually something that's like very weird and dichotomous. It's doesn't, they don't really go together, but they kind of tell a story. Um, and then this is a guy who's um, panhandling or, or, or a blind man who's uh, got his tin cup. And this is the Maryland National Bank building. So it was kind of like a very weird thing. Um, then you have, um, I, I find that a lot of these juxtaposition kind of things are humorous. Here's the American Stock Exchange. So again, it's, it's, it's showing something that doesn't really go. So of course there's no lifeguard on duty. The, the whole lake is frozen. The, no parking signs make this interesting with all the little, all the carriages. This is Bogger's um, Orchard. So again, I'm just I'm flipping through these because I think they're self-explanatory. This, this is one of my favorites. Where will you sleep tonight? Areas off limits to ghost hunters, um, uh, ghosts only. And then very quickly, tilt frame. Tilt frame again lets you put more into the image than you would if you um, did it straight up and down. As you all know, when they give you the measurement of a TV, the 75 inch screens are really 75 inch diagonally, not um, left to right. And then just finally, I just want to give, there's other lenses. We looked at telephoto lenses, but I also play with fisheye lenses because I think they're really interesting. Uh, they can be kind of some fun stuff. And a fisheye lens gives you a completely and totally weird uh, point of view. These are Forest Haven. And depending on where you point, how you point that, um, lens is how much you get as far as the curvature is. And I'm done. Well, Steve, wow. Thank you. Um, well, I learned a lot and I think I'm so motivated to go out and um, with my camera tomorrow and try some of these so thank you, Steve. Are We're getting, yeah. 
So uh, what I want to do is open it up to questions. So he's uh, offered to chat with us and answer questions. So turn your videos back on and microphones and ask away. Hi. Diane? Okay. Oh, well, you know what? I think Kay started talking. Kay, did you oh, have a I'm question? Sorry. Oh, no, I just wanted to say that I enjoyed it immensely. And you, uh, it would be fun to be in Steve's class. <laughs> Kay, that means a lot to me. Thank you. That was actually one of the questions I was going to ask was, how many years has it been now that you're te you've been teaching? And uh, what are what are can you give us an example of one or two of the interesting assignments that you've given people look trying to look at perspective? Do you just give them all of them or? Well, what what, what I what I, I've been teaching at CCBC for about. Um, 11 or 12 years, I just got my, I just got a 10 year pin because of COVID, we couldn't do it, but it's actually been about 12 years. So um, the, the, the classes, I teach several classes, my photography class, by the way, I just want to say that I haven't been to a lot of the meetings because my photography class, one of my photography classes is, at, is on Thursday night from 5.45 to 10.30. So unfortunately I can't, you know, and my, nor, nor can my students come to the meetings. So that really is, is bad news. But yeah, I think it's interesting. I have a, a, a the way I teach, um, I teach from something like the most simplest thing all the way up through other things. And, and the idea for the students is to put things together. So we start with texture, because I think texture is really important. And texture is really easy. So the first two assignments, the, the students are allowed to use any camera they have, a cell phone, um, a smartphone, a point and shoot, whatever. And then when they get to the other um, assignments, they have to start using a regular camera. So we talk about texture and why it's important. <clears throat> then we do point of view, which I think is incredibly important, but you can put texture with that. So you combine those. And the next assignment, we'll do something like um, um, motion. So that's uh, using the shutter. Um, we do aperture, which is not really, um, it has nothing really to do with light and how much light comes in. It's um, aperture has to do with depth of field and how do you do things like the photograph I showed of the, of the bride and the uh, groom and the mother, <coughs> excuse me, that's using a, a depth of field. How do you use a depth of field? So we talk about that. Then we do some other things and there's other assignments. And at the end, it's putting all that stuff together and coming up with their own, you know, what do they do to um, combine all these or what have they learned um, using all these different techniques and put together some really interesting assignments. So it goes kind of like, it's a progression of whatever. And this is digital one. So digital two goes into more, and there's a lot of Photoshop involved. And digital two goes into things more like panoramas and you know other things like that. So do you have a favorite perspective? Are you a bird's eye or a worm view? Or do you have a favorite combo? <laughs> Well, because you know, I know it's in street I, photography, I guess, well, is there yeah, a well, particular. But but here's the thing, um, Diane, and I, I mentioned this to Sandy when we had our little meeting, and it was really weird because I didn't, I felt like I was bragging, but I didn't really want to brag. I think what happens if you go out, and you start taking a lot of photographs, and I take a lot of photographs, as many of you do, and if you look at pictures, and I encourage my students look at pictures, look at pictures, look at pictures. I have a library of about 250, maybe 300 books. And I look at pictures and I go out and I take pictures. And what's happened is I didn't have a lot of things to show you that were, that didn't fit the point of view, things that I was talking about. And it's not bragging. It's just that I don't know how to take a picture that doesn't, you know, that, that all my pictures aren't great. But it's got it's it's going to have the thirds. It's going to have the bleeding lines. It's going to have the framing, things like that. I think my three favorite things are, um, and not in this order, are framing, uh, leading lines, and you saw the different types of lines that that are that, that are going, and and of course the different types of framing. And if I can do those two things without actually showing lines or impl you know implying lines instead of actually showing lines or frames, that's the kind of stuff I like. I also like dealing a lot with motion. So, um, and that to me is also a point of view is how do you show something? I have photographs, I think I've showed them before of, um, of uh, I, I love jazz and jazz is very kinetic um, music. And you, you know, I can't help but tap my foot when I'm listening to jazz or something. But if you take a photograph with a flash or a fast shutter speed, you freeze that motion 
which doesn't say to me kinetic energy. So um, slowing down the shutter speed, for instance, gives you that blur, which now you're talking about, I can show you images later on, but I think I did show them a, you know, a different, um, um, different uh, lecture. But yeah, I, I, I like that. The problem is I like all photography. Yeah. And all digital, right, so, um, hmm? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, I interrupted. Um, digital makes it so easy. You, you, it doesn't cost you anything. <laughs> So, so just one more, you said before uh, someone else goes on, you said at the beginning of the talk, you'd tell us about a book, but you never did. Oh, oh What's the sorry. Book? <laughs> Thank you. All right, a really great book, all right? This is like kind of like um, almost a Bible, let's say. It's um, um, Michael Freeman, it's called The Photographer's Eye. He does a couple of these, but The Photographer's Eye, I think is really interesting. He goes into very much uh, more detail than I do for things like he'll even go into cropping and how you can use cropping to get your your um, your thirds and all this sort of thing. It's a, it's a really great book, great photography. He has several books, but this one's one of my favorite about Photographer's Eye. I, I think it's really good. Um, so if you're interested in, in that, uh, it's Michael Freeman, Photographer's, it's by Focal Press. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's really good. I mean, I, I very much like it. Thanks, man. You're an awesome teacher. Thank you. Hey, Steve, I, I just wanted to say a great presentation and I am so, I am so glad that I decided against washing my hair tonight so that I could watch <laughs> this. So. Hey, Arthur, I got to show you something. I don't know if you can see it, but it's starting. Yeah. <laughs> Great Thank work, you. Steve. Thank hey, you Arthur, very thanks, man. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Any, well, and what? Anybody Steve. else? Yes. Yeah. I just want to make a comment. I just uh, this is Kenny. Hey, I thought Kenny. your uh, your presentation was very impactful and um, showed a different a lot of different views that we as photographers need to you know keep in mind, pay attention to that can really uh, take our photography to a different level. And I just want to thank you for your presentation. Thank you. It was yeah, a lot. And, um, <laughs> and it was very impactful and I enjoyed it. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And I, and I want to make it clear that you're absolutely right. The idea is you can't, now I'd also do street photography, which is my, my favorite genre, but you still can't negate or forget all these different points of view, even if you're doing street photography. But what happens is if you do a lot of it, it comes naturally. You know, you, you especially look, one of the things I have in my camera, I have that grid set up, that third grids, which I actually can use, but I'm also gotten to the point where I almost ignore it. But but you're right, Ken. You you you've got to, you know, go out there and 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 but look and and work at it. I mean, I'll sit there and be very patient and wait till somebody comes by for that that fit that image that you saw with the little the imps, the, the little mm -hmm. devils. I was probably there for 20, 30 minutes waiting for the right person to come by. Mm -hmm. But that's what you have to do. And you have to move around and look up, look down, look around. What was that TV show? That's one of those kids shows. I kind of I totally forgot. Well, the, the other thing, too, I think you say you have to shoot a lot. And, you know, just talking with other photographers, I think that when you shoot a lot, then it becomes instinctual. Mm -hmm. you, you automatically see it. You, 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 just, you just know the pattern when you see it. You know the perspective when you see it when you shoot a lot. And I think that's the biggest thing that, uh, a lot of the new photographers need to hear that um, the, the only way to get better, you had to keep shooting. Right. And, 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 and I, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I want to make it clear that Sandy said in the beginning that for all of you new people who are afraid to, um, to compete and put your images in the competition because you think other people are going to be doing better than you or you can't be, you can't do what they want to do. Absolutely, you can, and you won't learn if you don't try. I mean, that's like that's a great one. If you don't, if you don't try, you won't lose, right? But right. if you try, you need to try. You need to do it. Enter the competitions. Learn from your mistakes. Learn from you know. You'd be surprised. Look, you know, I'm like really proud of Diane Bovenkamp. All right. I mean, she made, she got, she, she's like no longer a novice. She's up there and, you know, with uh, some of the, some of the best in the club, but um, we all start I'm there. Right, I mean, I'm ready to retire now. What is it? I know. It's, it's, it's like, great. Hey, not <laughs> retired, sister. But, but, Kenny, but, but Kenny's right for everybody. And you know what? I don't even care if you're a novice. Um, go out and take photographs. Again, I tell my students, you know, my students for every, for every assignment, they have to take two to 300 photographs. 
for each assignment because then they have more to pick and choose from mm -hmm. and they get better. I would point out that I'm, uh, <coughs> I started putting stuff in as soon as I joined the club. And, you know, the, um, I learned so much from the uh, critiques of the images that I put in that, um, you know, it, it really helped my, my photography. So one other point, I just looked it up on my cell phone. Photographer's Eye is available in the Baltimore County Library System. Great. I just want you to know, it's a, it's a great book. It's really fantastic. But well, I, um, just, I just reserved it. So what can I say? Oh, well, then nobody else can have it. If you well, they can get it as soon as I'm done with it. <laughs> you know, Steve, but I wanted to say something. Um, what really helped me was that you included images that demonstrated what doesn't work. And then you would show the image that does work. And that really works for me because if I'm only seeing images that work, I might not get what the lesson is. And the fact that you do that and you show your own images that don't necessarily work. So I just think that's really a great teaching technique. Thank you. Sandy, I want you to know that I learned that from my students after my, like maybe the first or second class, one or two students said, show us what it looks like when it's not good. Well, it's effective. I got to tell you though, after taking hundreds of thousands of photographs, it's getting harder and harder to make a bad picture. Uh -huh. I'll offer you some of my images. How about that? <laughs> Your images are great, you know. <laughs> Any others? Sure. Kay, well, just... you, were you, were you, did you want to say something, Kay? I'd love to hear from you. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, I was just, it made me remember the days when I was teaching too. And several of your, your classes, several of the assignments were ones that I had given. And uh, it was just a, a nice memory going back to times that we can't do anymore. I'm so impressed that you can still teach. Uh, they haven't put you virtual yet, huh? Well. This past semester, I worked on campus. I way much prefer working on campus. I, I want to be in front of people. I can help them better. But um, and it also gets me out of house. But when I taught virtually, it's very difficult, I think, to teach photography. I teach two dimensional design, uh, three uh, um, digital imaging. I think it's really hard to teach studio classes virtually. And I also the type of person I am being the introvert that I am and the shy person that I am. I really, thank you, Sandy, but, but I really like to be in front of people and, and talking. I mean, it, it's giving a lecture is one thing, but actually going through things and showing. I had a student whose pictures came in really weird. They were just strange looking. I said, I, I, I thought maybe his lens was dirty. So I asked him, is your lens dirty? He's like, well, no. And so the pictures were still just, they were obviously, obviously something was wrong. So I actually met him. We all wore masks and stuff like this. This was when everything was virtual. His lens looked like he had just smeared Vaseline over top of it. So, but if I was in class, I would have been able to see that right away. Mm. So, so yeah, it's, it's, but it, it, and I, and I told my coordinator that I was going to die in front of my class instead of retiring. And, <laughs> and yeah, they'll be traumatized, but I'll enjoy it. <laughs> oh. Please don't. Good plan. <laughs> no, I'm talking like 80 or 90 years old. I mean, I'm not, not yet. I'm not ready. Even though you reduced my age by 10 years. That was really nice, Sandy. I thought you meant you were going to get Omicron. <laughs> oh, God, no. Oh, I've been boosted, man. It's all right. You know, no problem. And I wear a mask. <laughs> any other questions or comments? Yeah, Steve, do you do any um, studio lighting work? Any classes? Um. Uh, the, the, the guy that does the studio lighting is Mark Lane. You probably know him. Um, so, some of you might know him. He does studio. I do do studio lighting, but he sets it up so, so much. You know, it's, I don't have to do that much. Look, I have ADD, all right? Um, and doing something like setting up in a studio, and I do do studio work. I've done studio work. I don't like studio work because it's tedious and, to me, boring. 
but um, but yeah, we have to we teach it, and some students really like it, and I like I and there's things once it's done. I want to be the kind of photographer where you have the set designer and all these people set it up for you, and you just kind of go, and you're done, and then you give it to somebody else, and they develop it for you, and all that kind of stuff. That's that's the way it should be. I mean, there's no question. But that's why I love street photography because it, I'm always running. You could ask Arthur. I mean, he's been with me when I've run across the street and cars honking at me and you know all this kind of stuff and it's like what are you looking at and then he sees it and it's like damn so so maybe we need to do some stump the chump here and give you a topic of photography you haven't done before like food photography or something oh we did do food <laughs> looking down from above did you? remember oh yeah 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 you did you did oh man you've done it all can't food stump photography yet. i think food photography is really 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 hard Mm. I mean, I remember, I remember doing food photography and sushi, and I would not touch that sushi when we were done with it. <laughs> I mean, you put hairspray on anything, and it looks great, but that's <laughs> it. Uh, um, Steve, one other th thing I noticed in your presentation that I thought was really great, and I'm not sure if other people picked it up, uh, you do a great job of um, um, color harmony, putting colors together, you know, complementary colors that really make your uh, photography pop. And I think, you know, some of the young photographers, you know, that's something else you need to concentrate on, how to put colors together to make a, uh, an image really work, work itself. And I saw a lot of that in your work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, and again, that's one of those things that becomes, it, it, and, and I, I can't emphasize this enough of, of, of just taking pictures. I mean, going, you know, back in the day when we did film, yeah, you had an issue. You could take 36 pictures and then you had to wait two weeks till you get it back. But with digital, and then it costs money. Film is really expensive these days, believe me. But you have digital now and you can do it. And so the idea is what you want to get to is you want to take a thousand photographs and get 10 of them that are really great. But then eventually you want to get to the point where you've got 500 and 10 of them are really great. And then you want to get down to, if you look at National Geographic photographers, who I think are the greatest photographers in the, they're just, they're amazing photographers. They'll take thousands of photographs and five of them get published. That is true. I, I spoke to one. He did 10,000 photos. And it's, uh, I think his um, director or the person that picks their photos only picked 10. Yep. I mean, that these, the, and, and it's, and, and there's reasons for picking these things, but it's just really interesting. Bye, Joe. Bye, everybody. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really, um, it's really important, and, and I, I just can't emphasize enough. Be you know, join the join the competitions, um, and of course, if we have too many people joining the competitions, they'll take all night. But that's okay. Join the competitions. Learn if you lose. And as as a, a very famous PhD has said, um, you'll lose one hundred percent of the competitions you do not enter. Right, Diane. So anyway, but. That is true. But it's so true. So, but I can't emphasize enough to go out and take pictures. And you get to the point where it's difficult. It becomes difficult. And I really, I truly don't mean this as a brag, but it becomes difficult to take a really bad picture. It may not be a great picture, but you're going to have a pretty good picture. It's going to be, you know, worth something to you and to others. And you know, and again, the most important thing is if you like the photograph, it's a great photograph. Doesn't matter what the judges think. Doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It's a great photograph, if you love it. Agreed. <laughs> and you know what's really great when you have people who you respect, like, and I'm not disparaging anybody. I'm just talking about like Arthur and Kenny and and Kay and people like that. When those people um, like what you do, um, that's really wonderful. I, and again, I I need to say this to anybody that competes. Don't worry about the judges. Don't don't care about the judges. That's not, they're not important. It's the yourself. It's what you like and what you do that's mostly important. And if a judge sits there and says, "Oh, I don't like this," um, you can say, "Well, I do." <laughs> Big deal, you know. But take a lot of pictures. It's really and important, it's Steve. It's it's all about your vision, not their vision. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, Please. interestingly enough, some, some judges really don't know what you've done. They don't get it. But you have to be in enough competitions to, the, to 
until you get to the point where you actually are kind of brave enough or you have enough confidence to say, well, I don't really care what they think anyway. Exactly. You, you the, can't do that by watching somebody else go right. through it. Exactly. You have to it's, do it yourself. You're right, Scott. And that's the whole point about get into the competitions, do it, you know, yeah. it's more you what know, your peers say. I mean, like what they say matters, but you need to take it into consideration, like how much it matters. Like it can't just crush you and then you just disappear. That's not really, well, I, I like, I don't think that could happen to me. I think it would be impossible at this point, but because <laughs> some of the judges I appreciate, and some, it's I don't know. I, I don't think any of it would be able to well, you know, Scott, destroy me. Scott, I think the other thing is, is that judges need to be positive and, and, and they have to be give really good um, uh, constructive criticism and not be negative. I think that judges that tear you down and say, oh, I don't like it. It's not good. Blah, blah, blah. I don't think they're good judges. I think a good judge should be someone who's, who's who gives you constructive criticism. Like, you know what? I think if you level the, you know, it, my, my big pet peeve is a, is a level horizon you know maybe you might want to level the horizon or, or get a little closer to this thing not like oh this is horrible because it's not level and you know you need you don't know what you're doing that's a bad judge and you mm -hmm. know i wouldn't even worry about those judges and the judges that are good like we have a couple of really good judges like i think leo lebo is really good and um you know some of the others and they're they'll be constructive they'll say here's what you can do to make it better and and why don't you try this or whatever and those are the judges you want to listen to so scott you're absolutely right don't listen to what the judges say and unless it's a correct unless it's constructive and it, you you learn something from it it's not the judges who say oh, i don't like it the rise is bad or or i mean i had one where the judge didn't like it because the title was wrong i mean come on <laughs> just, just I mean, so our you judges know, are just so you know I'm looking forward to Leo saying yes to me. <laughs> <laughs> and our judges are are probably fairly con considerate, com you know, compared to like maybe a professional or an art school or something like that. So we're probably getting pretty soft treatment. But still, I mean, if you if you've been in fifty or a hundred competitions, you just don't. It just doesn't really phase you that much. You just hear what they say, and you don't really worry. It doesn't ruin your life if they if you know they don't like you. Listen, I well, also think it's I think it's really important also to get to get to the judges and do stuff with and let the club see what you're doing, because I remember when I was starting photography. Well, I was four years old, but my photography, my parents, my friends and family always said, oh, your pictures are great. Wow, you have great pictures. Those are awesome. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course, they're going to say that, you know. So then I joined the club and people were there were saying, hey, your pictures are pretty good. Or this one didn't win a competition or this one was good. <laughs> That that was meant more to me, obviously, than my parents saying, "Oh, your pictures are great." Yeah, well, you go out and you take too, like yeah. you go out and take a thousand pictures too, and you have enough sense to not show nine hundred of them. I mean, it just comes naturally because in the beginning you show everything, and that's just dumb because they're you know you just need to have some sense, and well, I think you just like learn that by curating you know yeah, by curating a, a portfolio. Well, a soft opening or trying of ideas to kind of jump off that for people who haven't entered. I know there's some people in here who haven't entered yet. Sandy, when is our next critique night? Maybe we can have one. That's a good way to put your vision in front of people and get feedback. We do not currently have a critique night schedule. Oh, on the schedule, I just can't remember where it is. Hang on, I'm going to look it up right now. Okay, and or people could all also share on Facebook, I guess, for feedback. Well, I, I would encourage people to use the, uh, the club's uh, Facebook uh, site for putting images out. I put them out fairly frequently. And yeah, I- For feedback. And I get, you know, it's good. I mean, I put one up recently and Jim said, you should try that in black and white. And I did, and he was right. And I reposted <laughs> it, so. Yeah. So just because it was mentioned, it's February 24th that we've got one coming up and another one in May, and there'll be another one during the summer. So I build it in every few months, one. Yeah. Good? Yep. Good. Yep. No, I, no excuses. Yeah? I was wrong, <laughs> I stand corrected. Yeah, I just, it's just not on the um, calendar. There's some adjustments I have to make because we had a cancellation. So I'll have that updated this week with the help it's of good Kay. to see everybody again. I, I just want to make one more comment. And I said this earlier, and I, I really mean this. It's not the camera. 
No. The eye. And um, Steve, that was a comment I was ready to make when we talk about um, just put your stuff in, don't worry about judges. Uh, when I do workshops, I, I try to um, let photographers know you are an artist, it's your work. It's not my work, it's your work. It's your eye, your vision, how you see things, your perspective. You know, it's like um, you have Picasso, you have um, uh, Monet, they're all different, different painters. But they're, but they're great artists. So, you know, when you don't worry about what a judge said, I mean, some, some things are fundamental that you need to know. But if a judge doesn't like your work, you know, it's just nitpicking, don't worry about it. It's your business. Not to mention, you know, some of those artists were hated when they came out. Exactly. Now yeah. that they, they work is worth me. So, so look, look, at, look at your photography. <laughs> look at your photography is your artwork. But what you do is, and, and, and Kenny's right, but, and what you do with these, with these judges, when you put your stuff in the competition, again, do not fear comp competition. You will learn from the judges, even when a judge says something they don't like, you know, usually they'll tell you, not all the time, but sometimes they'll tell you why they don't like something. Mm -hmm. You can learn from that, you yeah. know, and you're right. And you, if you know the, the, the fundamentals, like what I did tonight was really about the fundamentals. And if you can get those, and I noticed I didn't call it rule of thirds, um, I call it a guideline and everything I show you is a guideline, but if you follow some of these guidelines, I think your pictures will improve. I think you'll see that they work a little bit better, you know, mm -hmm. and we didn't even talk about portraiture. There's a whole nother thing about portraiture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, that's the next talk you'll give, okay? No. <laughs> <laughs> you can't rope in, Steve. One of the classes is portraiture. <laughs> Uh, All right. Kenny, I like your birds. <laughs> Any other comments? Cool. Thanks. Okay, thanks. it's nine. Yeah. Well, Steve. thanks for having me, everybody. Oh my God! Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, it was Thank amazing. You, Learned so much. You're a great teacher, as everybody has said. And, and Arthur, Arthur's, I'm just, I'm really ecstatic that Arthur said it was okay that he didn't have to do his hair. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go do it right now. All right, it's all you, you and, hung and out. Arthur is well, going wait a to minute. Be, all and, two minutes. Well, and, also we never, also you know, remember he turned off his video and his mic, so we're not really sure if he actually stayed. <laughs> I, 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 I stayed. I actually, I actually made notes, Steve. Oh my God! You can, wow. you can give him a quiz. Ten characters notice, on there. Well, notice I kept them all on a single. I kept them all on a single sheet of paper. So I see. I don't, saw that. Don't, 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 get, don't get too excited. They're all, they're all, they're all here. And and we have in March, um, Arthur speaking. Oh, so he, yes, you can give yes. him a bad time, Steve, if you want to, or Arthur, you and, can. And I'm sure and he, he will. will. And I'm sure he will. <laughs> I'll look forward to it. Yeah, but, but Arthur, I do have hair that I can wash. <laughs> Please do. Okay. Although it's going, although it is going, I gotta say. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks, bye, everybody. Okay, right, bye. Everybody. bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Don't change, Steve. Shoot your macros. Right. I'm going to end the meeting. <laughs>